Hi, welcome to Break Free with Top Rank Marketing. I'm Joshua Knight. I'm a Senior Content Marketing Manager at Top Rank Marketing, and I'm here today with Claire Carr. She's the VP of Marketing at Parsley. Claire, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I know you are a very data-driven, data-centric marketer, and I know that data is almost its own discipline as well. Uh, so which came first for you, the data side or the marketing side? They were definitely intertwined from the start for mm. me. I was very focused on data after the fact though. So data that told us how we were doing, that analyzed our performance, that uh, we would provide to um, clients, uh, especially when I worked at a publishing website, about how big our audience was or you know how many ad impressions that they would get if they, if they bought ads with us. Um, so that was sort of my introduction to data. And then I made a transition from data as only an afterthought to much more of a beginning source of inspiration and uh, you know something that we used at the beginning of our strategy, not just to evaluate how our strategy did at the end. And so you started in the publishing industry? I did, I did. I started at a company called Green Tech Media. They did, they, they still do uh, renewable energy coverage. They also have an events and research program. And you know, so it was uh, a B2B website, um, B2B audience, and uh, I was very heavily immersed in trying to, you know, optimize content there too. You know, we wanted to make sure our, our audience uh, had things that they wanted to read about and that they were engaged with the content we were producing. And one of the ways I did that was look at analytics about, you know, did they like solar energy more? Or did they like energy efficiency news? And uh, the more I got into that, the more I realized how much you could do with it. It is amazing how that field of SEO has gone from very prescriptive where like we are going to figure out how many keywords we have to shove in this mm -hmm. thing to very data driven. Like we have to determine what the demand is. We can't just shove it down people's throats. Do you feel like that? Absolutely. Okay. And and people will tune out uh, content that isn't valuable to them. That's I think one of the biggest changes uh, over the past 10 years. You know, you, you used to be able to sort of trick algorithms um, and, and Google's just, they've gotten smarter. Audience have more uh, choices than ever before. They, they read, they have more websites to visit, more things to do online. And if you don't capture their attention with valuable information, it goes somewhere else. <laughs> and so data is kind of becoming a way that we can get at what these people want, what kind of information they want. It feels like we started as a data-driven marketer would be someone who was able to track everything, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. able to give their, conversion path and figure out the KPIs and the metrics they need to measure. But now we're talking about applying data to content. I find that very interesting. Yeah, I, I just talked about it at a session and I think the biggest takeaway that people are surprised by is that data can be really closely associated with your brand. It can be something that makes you unique and memorable and it's something that uh, is, is hard for other people to replicate. Um, and so if you can make data something that people associate with you, you know, they, they trust you more and you can connect with them more and you can tell better stories and all those things you want as a, as a content marketer, as a, a B2B marketer, data can actually do for you, not just good writing, good storytelling and good creative. So are you talking with, about data kind of defining a brand? Are you talking only about the first party research that brands might do or is there another way to associate that value of the data with the brand? Uh, first party research is, is certainly one way to do it. I think internal data in general is something mm. that more brands should look at and see what they have available to them and how they can use that uh, for for content. So for instance, uh, the, the data that we use is aggregate data. We're an analytics company. We uh, Individual clients look at their own dashboard, but we can see trends across 10 billion monthly interactions with content. And so uh, we look at uh, we look at a lot of things, but one of the things that uh, we get asked about a lot is, are more people reading content coming from Facebook or are they coming from Google? Mm. And that has changed over you know, uh, the years. I'm um, sure. <laughs> it, it has gone a little bit like that. And others, you know, referral sources too. And so that's all information that is uh, basically runoff data for us. It's data that we have. Mm -hmm. We're not using it in our product. We can write a lot about it. We can share it with people. We can help them understand how they fit into the broader trends of the industry and whether they're, you know, sort of on track, if there's things they need to change to their strategy. So it becomes a content source. It becomes client mm -hmm. engagement. It becomes industry information. We just think that there's a lot of companies not using their own internal data to mm. that maximum capacity. I think you got a point there because it, like, 
it is a, just a truism of humanity that what is my favorite topic on myself. Yes. So if we talk about what do people want to hear about really for content, well, yourself, your business, how you fit into the industry. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, are you seeing that? Like if you reflect to the customer what's happening with them, they're finding value in that? Oh, absolutely. We've run uh, programs where we uh, allow people to give their numbers and compare it to the industry averages hmm. and say, you know, you are, you are outperforming on search traffic, but you don't have as much social as other sites your size or, or direct traffic or whatever. And that might be fine. You know, we're not saying that the industry average is something that everyone should ascribe to, hmm. but it's, we help people understand why they might be different. And if it's something that they should maybe work on or apply some efforts to, or if it's something that, that is perfect for their audience and, and fits right into their strategy. It seems like there is a good, I hate the word synergy, but it, sometimes those are the only words we have. You know, There is a synergy between like the business value of showing someone, here are the holes in your strategy, or here's how you're doing compared to the industry, but also the real value that that has to a customer. So those kind of overlap in a good way, it feels like. Yeah, and that's what I was saying before. I think if you're not providing actual value to someone and, uh, and so we've just thought you know not only why is this data interesting but how can someone use it in their day-to-day -day, uh, to improve their work we're here to do we're, we're here to help people get you know bigger audiences to engage with them and our data should help them do that uh, and we should provide value every step of the way for them to do that absolutely now, as a content person though I always feel like there is a divide between the data-driven side of marketing and the content side. Like the, the folks who do the PPC and some of the deep SEO magic in our office, mm -hmm. they, see, they almost speak a different language than I do. And, so, and I've to try to keep more of my feet on the ground now as we do the light, fluffy, creative content stuff. But how do you get that data to like the content folks in a way that it makes sense to them and they can use it? That is the big challenge, and I think a lot of people underestimate how important it is to combine those worlds. It's repetition is, is bringing uh, data to them that they understand. So if you're, if you're in, on the content side, clients that use Parsley actually for that purpose. They bring their Parsley reports that are really easy to understand data to their data team and say, hey, you know, we're, we're doing some really great stuff with this too. Here's the data to prove it. How can we work together? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then their, their PPC team or their, their SEO team says, hey, wait a second, this content's really performing. We're going to start building that into our programs as well. Um, and so we've, we've seen some companies have a lot of success with that. But it's it takes... Uh, there is a human element that cannot be taken out of this equation and you have to maybe sometimes buy people beers or pizza or maybe a, a gluten-free option, you know, depending on <laughs> what everyone wants. It's them that both sides of these coins are very important uh, and ultimately if you want the success of your company, you're going to need them both to work. And please make sure to tell my boss that you said sometimes you have to buy them beers and pizza. I mean, they actually do. So I think we're probably ahead of the industry curve. Yeah, there. yeah. So how are people doing with this so far? Like, what are you seeing in the industry as far as sophistication and maturity? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think the people who, who do well with this really stand out. Um, I don't think it's, it's commonplace yet. Mm -hmm. I think sales companies um, that I think do it really well, Salesloft uh, is a company that I think has some awesome data-driven research on their blog. IO uh, is a company that sales calls and then they actually analyze those sales calls and put out data on it, which I find super fascinating. They are fascinating. That's yeah. one that I know. Yeah. yeah. B, I, th I think, which they do a mm -hmm. good job of. Um, I think there could be a lot more consumer side people mm -hmm. doing interesting stuff with this. B2B sort of looking like consumers, maybe. Uh, I think there's so everyone, you know, if you have an app, and a lot of companies do data in there that you can be creating content out of. I wonder if there's, so we've been hearing a lot over the week that B2B companies need to be more emotional. And now I'm hearing B2C companies need to deal more with data. And it's almost like there is this divide, but well, B2C, we, we don't, you know, they, our people don't care about logic and data and mm -hmm. numbers and B2B is our people only care about these things. And of course, it's gotta be a combination of both for both, right? that um, gets lost when we start getting in the nitty-gritty of, of marketing, I think, in general, mm -hmm. is that our audiences are human, and so they have two sides to their brains, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't matter if they are business decisions or consumer decisions, they are the same person, 
And so if they want data in their business decisions, they probably will use those in their consumer decisions as well. Um, so that's something I, I actually try to drill into my, my team a lot mm -hmm. is just remember that the person you're talking to is a human at the end of the day and you are human too. And how would, how would you like to be spoken to? Do you forget about emotion when you walk into the door at work? Of course not. You know? I would only make logical decisions right. <laughs> within these four walls. Yeah, yeah, if any of your coworkers act like that, it, uh, I think you should probably reward them because otherwise you have to deal with their emotional <laughs> side too, which we are all used to doing. Yesterday I was at a presentation with April Henderson from Forrester, who you would expect to talk exclusively about data, mm -hmm. and she was there to talk about blending those two. And she said a quote which is, it's so obvious, but at the same time, it's the obvious that you can't see. Yeah. It's just right there. And she said, people use the same brain to make <laughs> business decisions yeah. as they do consumer. We don't have two brains, you know, we're using just the one. So you have to appeal to that entire person. The paper, um, and I, I forget, it, it's from a while ago, and it, it talks about the, the brand that has the most emotional with, uh, with people. And if you ask people to guess, they often say McDonald's or Coca-Cola or mm. Apple. The brand is Cisco because mm. people who buy Cisco, the price point is so high that if they make the wrong decision, they lose their jobs. And that means that they can't feed their families. And that means that their life is disrupted. And those are emotional mm. triggers for people. And so their business decisions, yes, but they impact the very core function of your life brain and it also uh, impacts us in these, in these ways that you know when you think about the, the full life cycle of someone's decision and what that actually mm. impacts there's we talk about these tactics and these these little things that we can optimize and, and the PPC you know how can we tweak this mm. that way or this way and we forget that talking about these obvious things that people are people that uh, they respond to things in neurological ways that <laughs> they have uh, needs like feeding their family and Gallery at the end of the day, and if you address those, they will respond very, very positively. So I always like to repeat the obvious because I think sure. we don't talk about it enough. That makes me think of the old. Uh, there's an old industry adage back in the 50s and 60s that nobody ever got fired for that. buying IBM, mm -hmm. right? And so it wasn't IBM has the best computers or IBM is the best for your business. The people who are making those decisions, what they were thinking is, no one ever gets fired for buying IBM. I will so be that's safe the one at my I'm job. To go with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Maybe not what you want to aim for from your brand, right. but <laughs> it is motion and that, that driver is something that every marketer needs to think about. How do they fit? Are they the IBM or are they the thing that could get someone fired? Mm -hmm. And if you were a brand that could get someone fired, how do you address that in your marketing? Right? That's something that you should right. actually speak to. And maybe you do start with some people have gotten fired for buying our stuff because some people aren't ready for how awesome Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. Yeah. But you're right. That is that, that emotional well is the the base where we have to start and build from. Mm -hmm. Because of my mixed metaphor, we're now building on top of a well, but it should go okay, <laughs> I feel like. So we have the data and we're, we've convinced our content marketers that it is something that they should be interested in. How do you start to tell those stories with the data? Questions. Uh, I, I you try to think like a journalist. There's mm. a lot of great investigative journalism out there of, of people who have dug into data and found really interesting stories that can be used you know, guideposts maybe, uh, or examples, you know, is this interesting to me? Is this data interesting to me? Probably interesting to someone else, mm -hmm. right? But that's not just true of data. I think any content marketing answer interesting questions um, or provide interesting answers to questions. Do that with data, mm -hmm. you know, that, that will go a long way uh, for your content marketing program. Didn't prep you ahead of time for this, so if you don't have one, that's great. That's fine. But do you have an, ex an example of a brand, or even if you can anonymize, just what that looks like in practice? 38 and the Upshot are you know, entire brands that have been mm -hmm. built around asking questions with, with data. And I think if you go look at some of those stories, if you're a content marketer, translate those into content marketing very easily, right? Mm -hmm. Or you, could, you can imagine how you could potentially have written one of those stories. Marketers come from journalism backgrounds. You know, we have people on our teams often that, that come out of these roles, and I think they, they think that way. Pudding is also another site that's just visualization as well. Mm -hmm. Data that they share isn't even new data. It's just presented in a way that people haven't thought of before. Mm -hmm. And again, there's no reason that content marketers can't do that as well. 
World Wildlife Foundation have some really interesting content marketing that they've done with, with stats around the programs that they've run or, or how you know, wildlife populations are doing in general. So if you have any program that has, you know, you want to make an impact, even if, again, populations aren't their data, that's just publicly available data, but if they can make an impact about their story with that da data, that's going to probably move the needle a lot with the people who are, are donating or, or you know, activating in their programs. It feels like that is a good way to repurpose content too. If you have that data mm -hmm. sitting there not doing anything for you, get the design team yeah. to make something beautiful, get the content team to add a little spice to it, and you have a new infographic or a video. Absolutely, yeah. You should be reusing data in every single possible format you, you can. I've been using the same data set for six years. <laughs> and uh, people, I, I still use it in new formats. I still come up with new ways to use it finding it every day and they still find it interesting. So I'm, I'm not going to stop until uh, people stop finding it interesting. We talk about data, we always think about the privacy issues, of course, are getting more and more yeah. play. Uh, it seems to me you're talking, though, about anonymized data, yeah. which is, so people wouldn't have to worry about that. Always, you have to be really careful. Um, we use an anonymized data set. Uh, we do have IP addresses in, in, our, in our data set. We don't release them, but, but we have access to them. Depends on how around privacy is um, and what data you're using. For example of a, a fitness brand that did release a data study and it turned out that they released the locations of some military bases because some military personnel was wearing their smart technology watches. It was a big scandal. You just have to be really careful about it. But I think much information you can look at at an aggregate level that I think that there's, uh, you don't need to dive into any personal information to make this stuff work. And I don't think you, you want to, because I think that, that might scare people away a little bit. I think I agree. There's so much value to be had in just, like you were saying, showing people how you compare with this huge anonymized yeah. pool. Fitbit, another example that I really like, Fitbit did one that was, uh, when does everyone wake up around mm -hmm. the world? So in each city, and they apparently wake up much earlier than in New York, where mm -hmm. everyone wakes up at like 10 a.m. Um, <laughs> about that and that was I thought a great example of information that I was able to say man I'm way lazier than a lot of my <laughs> one of my colleagues or or the people that live in my city also use that within their app so it's you know client engagement user engagement and content marketing I feel like it would be a totally different study though if they could get the data on when people want to wake up oh yeah that's gonna be different because you know I get up at 645 but I want to get up at 10 a.m. Maybe I just need to move to New York. Uh, join us. Uh, we work really late. We just mm. kind of start later, too. unless you're in finance, and then I, then I can, we can't help you. Adding, actually, that's a good point. Adding qualitative data to quantitative is sort of the, the ideal world, too. Mm. So anything you can layer on top of aggregate data, I think, is, is really valuable. The thought leadership, I think, comes into play is a, a term I would want to break free of, I think, a mm -hmm. little bit. But when you can combine it with data and explain the data, then I think your thought leadership becomes a lot more valuable because you're not just putting out there. You're actually you know, helping people understand something that, that helps them in their job. Okay. So you have, here is the data on when people are waking up. And me as a content person goes, oh, and we asked 12 famous people yeah. or influencers when they get up. And then our CEO has a blog on when you should get up and why. Absolutely. And you just bring all those together and you have this beautiful content ecosystem that's data driven. I would read it. I would write it. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> so tell me, how can people get a hold of you who listened to this and thought it was amazing? Uh, I would love to, to talk to anyone who has more questions about this. I'm on Twitter at Claire. Andre, which is O-N-D-R-E-Y, and uh, you know the blog at Parsley, we share a lot of our own data and research, so if you're interested in that kind, we're blog.parse.ly, and uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well, Claire Carr, so to reach out to people interested in this topic. I would ask, uh, we uh, also do a lot of work with Jennifer Warawa, who works at Sage, mm -hmm. and have Parsley and Sage ever collaborated, and if not, can they please? I really want us to create a product called Sage, so mm -hmm. that we can have Parsley, Sage, maybe Rosemary and Thyme someday. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, everyone on our team is, is uh, behind this partnership. The Scarborough uh, Fair initiative. Yes, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So our last giant, huge question that can mean really whatever you want it to mean. How can B2B companies break free? I, you know, I'm going to re repeat something from before, but I think that B2B companies can break free 
exploring things by remembering that their audience is human and treating them that way. Creative stories that appeal to the emotional side of people that also meet their business goals um, and really think about how to do that. I would love to see more emotional content. Just very cold, cold hard facts. Uh, As a guy who makes it, I would love to see that too. <laughs> yes. We will, we will be the change that we want to see exactly. in the industry. Yes. Yeah, that's what you have to do. Well, Claire, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And stay tuned for our next installment.